Hey out there, uh, welcome to Nerdarchy for Nerds by Nerds. I am Nerdarchist Ted, filling in for uh, Dave today. And with us, we have the master creature creator, uh, Brian. Want to introduce yourself and your stuff? Sure. Hey, everybody. I'm Brian Colon, creature curator. Uh, some of the weirdness behind me are the beasts that come from my fantasy world of Revelo. So uh, the Kickstarter for Revelo is currently up. It is down in the description down below. If you want to go check that out while you're listening or wait until this is over and then go check it out, I would strongly, re strongly recommend it. Uh, it is going to be not only an art book, but it is a bestiary as well. Yep. It's a, so it is. It's a, my world, Revelo, uh, I started creating about eight years ago, right before my son Wyatt was born. And I wanted to create a world that we could kind of build out together. So the book has the, the world broken down by regions uh, with the different species that we've created so far with photos of the sculptures, stories that I've written. And uh, my wife has helped uh, collaborate on the stories and then illustrations of the creatures as well for some of the full bodies. Because if you see like... The, just the head part, you want to be able to see the full physiology of the beasts. And that, that is uh, that is pretty amazing. As a as a bestiary, like is that going to be actual in, incorporated stats for an RPG, or is that just as a you know more into what the actual creature is and no actual game stats? Sure. So right now it's just going to be the information about the beasts, where they live, uh, what they look like, uh, and more about their societies. But as the Kickstarter goes, if I get if I get to a certain stretch goal, I'm already working on fate conversion, because that's the system that I play in regularly. And then uh, if we hit the specific stretch goals, which I haven't really determined exactly where financially they are yet, but then I'll okay. do a P PDF version of 5e and Pathfinder if we can, if I can get enough interest in it. Nice. That's, uh, that's I don't know if you've seen some of the other um, bestiary art book, the live chat with um, uh, the you know, the Crystal Sully, yep. who, mm -hmm. who did one, as well as, um, I think it's Metal Weave Games, the Atlas Animalia. Uh-huh, yep, with Sarah. Uh, but both... Yes, Sarah Dellinger, yep. I, think, yeah. I think her name is. But mm -hmm. we we um you know we talk to them and they have that same setup that it's an art book, you know, it's, you know, put it on your coffee table, put it on your bookshelf, but then it's gonna have the PDF of the actual stats. So it's like you know, right. that kind of stuff I find so so enjoyable because then mm -hmm. you can then you can take that book and put it out there for the players. And it doesn't give them any actual information because uh -huh. that's all behind the screen. So, yep. um, you know, you literally could be like, "Oh, you find this book and you hand it to them." Now right. they know exactly what's there, but uh -huh. you know, you don't you don't have that um, that that leak of information. Right. Absolutely. And it's got the the photos, so you really get a real sense of what they would look like three dimensionally if you were encountering them in the world that you're playing in. So your uh, your your creations, you've mm -hmm. been making them for about eight years now. You told me mm -hmm. off camera that your your first one you made while why it was in utero. Yes. Yes. So the very first beast that I made that was large because I I self published comics in. 1999 and 2004 and then I slowly worked my way towards sculpting. Um, I was customizing toys and then one day I decided I needed to do something that was life-size because my sculpting was starting to look more like really more realistic but it was like oh that's a cute little weird monster and I wanted it to have the real impact that like if I was walking in a dungeon this is what I would see you know. So um, the first one that I created um, is a, a reaper, which is a species that's in my world that there have been a lot of different variations of as they've evolved over time. And it's a, it has a second face down its, in its chest and it kind of looks like it has a deer type body almost, but when it's standing more kangaroo like, and because my wife was pregnant with Wyatt at the time, the whole idea of parasites and something living off of another being, I really incorporated multiple creatures into one being a lot in my work interesting um so the 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 bigger things that you've created uh <laughs> that ostrich behind you yes how, how long does something like that take so that struthia is uh i want to say that one probably took about 
12 ish hours total from start to finish from concept drawing it to sculpting it but then there's things on here that are those are real seashells that i back oh, wow. like i put gorilla glue on the back to reinforce them <laughs> and i uh, primed them and painted on top of it i made the eyes myself i designed the plaque and hand cut that out that's so uh, bigger it's, it's ones take longer What's it's that? just amazing work. It's amazing work. Uh, Dave has actually seen some of some of your stuff, you know, in person. Yeah, you said he met you at at Origins. Uh, so it was mm -hmm. awesome to actually be able to get get you on and actually talk to you about some of this stuff because those things Thank you. they really are beautiful. Thank you very much. And seeing so, them in person is so much different because you know. <laughs> but yeah. So we actually have a question in the chat: Is do you have any plans to stretch into VTT formats? VTT, I don't know what that's an abbreviation for. It's from Fantasy Grounds College, so I'm going to guess guess it's for virtual tabletop. Oh, virtual tabletop, yes. Um, I have, so jumping ahead, so this is, you know, I'm running the Kickstarter now for the art book. Um, in May, June, I'm partnering with uh, Norse Foundry on a couple of campaign modules that are more of a gaming accessory that's going to be for Fate, uh, 5e and pathfinder and they're all going to be set in my world and it's going to be broken down by regions so the first two are going to be the uh, fiery pits and the icy divide and i had interest in discussing that in the future uh once we get a little bit closer to that i've just been i've had my head so buried in getting this art book done and out because i wanted the final product to be as close to finished when i launched the kickstarter as possible i want to get this in people's hands i want to have it for conventions this year i don't want people to have to wait a year for it to come i want i want this this year so i've been very nice. in that uh so speaking speaking of of that uh down in the description below there is a link to a gleam contest uh, Brian is actually going to be give, doing a giveaway live. So you've got a little over a half hour left if you want to go sign up for that. Uh, you know, go into the in the link below or go in the description below, grab that link, sign up for it. There's a whole mess of prizes that Brian's going to be giving away. And he decided he wants to do it live on our show, which That's right. you know, not, not only is that awesome that you know he's doing it on our thing, but you know, there's a chance that if you guys get into it you might get it you know and it's ready to ship so do you want to yes. go into what what is actually uh giving being given away sure so uh one of the things that i'm giving away is this is uh, called a groblin from my world Revlo. uh last year at this this time of year in january i did a kickstarter to make resin cast versions of this guy and this is my last artist proof of that um so i was going to give that away i'm going to have two of the Fate books in there, Fate Core and the Fate System Toolkit. I'm going to have a subscription to World Anvil, who has been on your show. I discovered them by watching watching your episode, and I love World Anvil, and I can't wait till I can spend some more time actually putting my content into their system, because it's fantastic. Um, nice. I'm going to have a play mat of my, let's see, is that right? My Hammer of Grunthar. Um, oh, which that is actual, beautiful. Thanks, the actual hammer's right here. But uh, uh, um, play mat. I'm gonna have uh, awesome metal fate dice from Norse Foundry, some Norse metal coins from them, a sticker pack with a bunch of stickers from my weirdness. Um, I think I've covered everything. Yeah, it's about a $300 prize package, uh, all for like nice. signing up and following me on social stuff. And yeah, yep. Go go to the Gleam contest below. You got. 36 minutes to to sign up for it. Brian, as I said, he's going to click the button, pick the winner, and we will we will announce it. So, yay, yay, yay. Uh, so if we could actually get into detail in your your Kickstarter for a little bit. Yeah. Is that cool? cool? Absolutely. All right. So so I, I look, look through it. You know, not only is the artwork awesome, but you've got coins that are available. You've got the book. You've got the ability to get um, you know, an artist sheet, as well as if you want to go all out, you can actually design a, you know, design a creature with Brian. And is that something that's going to be in the book and they get a sculpture? Is that how that works? It is. So um, I've done a number of commissions for people in the past. So I wanted to be able to find a way that if people were really into what I'm creating and really love it, we could collaborate on a piece together work ideas out, I present concept sketches back and forth, and then I actually sculpt the piece 
that gets put photographed, put in the book. I write the story about it, and then I ship that out to the person that, that pays for it. So that, they that actually have awesome. their hand in Revelo. Yep. Thank you. So that's yeah, a. No, go ahead, Ted. Sorry. Being a being a monster maker myself, I I love creating stuff. I love getting my hands, you know, in there and making up stuff. And as I had told you, you know, off air. I like creating stuff so that I can surprise my players so that they have no idea what it is because it's not out of a book. It's out of here. It's out of my head. Uh -huh. um, you know, that's a, uh, that's one of my favorite things about some of these creatures. Like I'll I get have... into that, get a full 3d sculpture that you uh -huh. can be able to hang on the wall or put on a shelf of your creation. That's, that's awesome. Thanks. The uh, it's so it's awesome because I hear there's a there's a uh, gaming bar up in Ontario that has a couple of my sculptures in it, uh, the Round Table Tavern, and one of them is the Bernadazzi, which is uh, a lizard man from the the fiery pits, the volcanic region of my world. Uh, so the fiery pits, my son, uh, who's when he when we were first working on the the idea of the map, he's like, I want volcanoes, and he was about five then. So I went to him and I was like, what do you want the, the first creature from this region to be? And he's like, I want a lizard man. So I drew up the, my, the Bernadazzi, showed it to him. He liked it. So then I sculpted it. But that's hanging up in their, uh, their tavern. And they actually play Pathfinder there. And they've incorporated that species into their campaign setting. So like when their people are playing, they can be like, yeah, there's five of them over there. That is awesome. <laughs> Now the uh, you know the starter, I don't see anything for actual add-ons. So if somebody wanted, you know, a, a second sketch or just a sketch or a set of coins, is that something that you're planning to do with, um, you know, like the you know the campaign backer after it's over the backer kit? Uh, is that yes. something you're gonna? Okay. It is. I'll, uh, you know what? I need to go in and make that more clear because I put it in the FAQs, but I'll do some visual about it because basically if you wanted the book and the coins but didn't want the sketch, you could do pledge at the $40 level, then add another $12 for the uh, for the coins and go ahead and pledge $52 and that would be it. Yeah, is that, you know, I'm, I'm big into, into the coins and uh -huh. I'm guessing based on the fact that... Uh, you know, you, you've already, you know, you've already been talking about Norse Foundry, the coins being made by them. Yes, of course. And I've seen the digital proof of the first one, and I can't wait to have the physical one in my hand because I, I went ahead and got, I'm getting samples of the first coin done just so I can see it and feel it. And uh, mm -hmm. they're going to be really, really awesome. I'm thrilled. Just I, the idea of having currency for Revelo, just that's crazy. I actually have some coins by Norse Foundry. I know they have a uh, spectacular work. So yeah. seeing seeing that and seeing you know the artwork on the actual page, I am looking forward to getting uh, you know getting that as a uh, as a reward. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, the uh, I'm going with the standard uh, thickness that they do on all their coins because they do a little thicker than some some other places. I can't remember how many millimeters Drew said, but um, I'm doing the standard thickness with that, and so it should it should be pretty. They should be pretty rad. Yeah, they've got the ability to, you know, because they're a little bit thicker, they have that, mm -hmm. that nice solid weight to them, but uh -huh. they also have the ability to then add a little bit more detail to the coins without it actually affecting the the, the thickness or the flimsiness of it. Uh-huh. And each coin, it's hard to tell on that image, but each coin on the back, even if they still have that same, uh, my same logo, the, the, the symbol on there, the texture pattern that's behind each coin is going to be slightly different so that it like one's more scaly, one's more feathery. We actually have someone from Norse Foundry in the chat and they said it's three millimeters is their Excellent. Standard. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, uh, we're going to be making all sorts of crazy stuff together in the future. Very cool. I, that's, that's, that's got to be a, uh, an awesome partnership there. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's all just from going to conventions and meeting people and being friendly with everyone that you can, you know? Absolutely. So do you have a favorite creature that you have curated? Huh. Let's see. So my current favorite is this one right here. Only because it's, it's, sli it's slightly off camera. Can we get a tilt? Oh, yeah, sure. Actually, <laughs> there we go. Oh, very cool. The, the reason that this one's my current favorite is just it's the color palette is so different from what I traditionally do. 
Um, it has a more like Dr. Seuss whimsical feel to it, um, especially in the face up here. Um, so that's that's my current favorite. But you know, most of them I'm happy to just get out in the world and have them be in somebody else's house. That was one that uh, my wife uh, Carrie liked as well. So we decided I decided that as our as our uh, anniversary present, that would be one that would be part of the permanent family collection. <laughs> So you you have built these creatures. So you've actually looked at not only you know what this thing is, but you've gone a step further and talked you know with, with your 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 bestiary your 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 book that it actually is affecting the world in in such a way. So you've made regions. So therefore, there's creatures that you've got the predators and you've got the prey. Like is is have you gone to that to that level? I haven't actually. Um... I would say probably like 80% of what's in the book are all intelligent species. So wow. it's all like they have cities and societies and it's like when, when I do the fate book, people are going to be playing a lot of these different species as opposed to playing humans wow. or dwarves or elves. So it's more about building up the creating the underlying themes that are going on in the overarching story without telling the story so that other people can, can tell their own tales. So these things are, are, are they creatures? Are they humanoids? Like how, how, how do they look? Cause so far what I've seen doesn't look uh -huh. humanoid esque to me. So is this, right. is this world just devoid of humanoids? Uh, there's, I'd say out of the 80% that are, and I'm just pulling random numbers out of my head out of the 80% that are intelligent, about half of them are more humanoid, you know, like, okay. like, like this groblin creature, although this is a young groblin, their heads get a little bit bigger. They stand about three feet tall. They are humanoid in form with two legs and two arms and wear clothes and have cities and, uh, and okay. that sort of thing. So other species, like the one that I just pulled down, the, that Lacanap, that's, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, I mean, a coral uh, that I pulled down, they look more like an ostrich almost. Though they are intelligent, they don't wear clothes and they're not humanoid in form, but they still have uh, conversations and they, they gather in tribes and they, they migrate together and build huts about, and things like that. What about the ostrich thing behind you? Like this? Those, yes. No, that's just an animal. That's just an animal. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's utterly gorgeous. You know, so Thank you. like, you know, Thank I'm you. like, well, is this something that I can actually play? You know, how does that work? <laughs> no, not that one. Not that one. And I'm not sure, like so far I've only built out for my current fate game that I'm running uh, with my, with uh, my, my first beta play testers. We only have five species that are playable, but I'm probably going to expand that to about, 10 for the book i would think okay so they're currently they're debating on whether it's more dark crystal like or more labyrinth like <laughs> you know either one is great <laughs> uh, I, I love both of those and uh, i'm uh, sure both of those have had a huge influence on me growing up so i, I was gonna say was is there any you know kind of specific inspiration from any of that stuff in some of the some of your work you know growing up nerdy you just kind of absorbed everything uh, the the biggest I, I really think the the biggest influence was playing D and D though and coming up with my own creatures and you know the, the, I I told you off camera that I started when I was in fourth started playing D and D in fourth grade with the red box because I was hanging out with two friends and we were actually starting to play with matches and his parents caught us and his older sister was like here why don't you why don't you do this instead so. I started, run, I started running a game. I'm terrible at comprehending and reading rules. So instead of like hit dice, I was using that as hit points. So I had like third level players killing red dragons. It was, uh, it was pretty crazy. So the, the older sister is technically who got you into D&D? &D? Yeah, I had friends that were twins and their older sister gave, us, gave them their first red box. And then I quickly went out and picked one up. That's a, that, that's a re relatively unheard of given that time frame. Totally. That's a that's a that's a new story. <laughs> uh, all right. So this is totally off topic from what we're talking about. But uh -huh. uh, Vel Velour says, "What do you think about mixing pantheons from Forgotten Realms, Greyhawk, and Eberron?" Um, I'm totally cool with you doing it. <laughs> but 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 for me, I've I've built my own pantheon of gods, and they're all in the book. Uh, I have my own story about how the world came about, how the first god then created children, and those are the gods, and how they're all currently in hibernation, and that's where the magic comes from. So, so for for our world, we we kind of do the same thing. We have our own our own pantheon, and 
you know, if you've if you follow along, you you realize that there's a lot of stuff that we've stolen from our previous campaign world that we made, and we're just importing uh-huh. whatever we wherever we need. But you know, to to actually you know expand on that question, what I would want to do is I would want to have some kind of like cataclysmic event and actually have these three worlds collide uh-huh. almost you know gamma gamma world style uh-huh. and it then becomes like a battle amongst the gods and and like see who actually remains and uh-huh. you could literally then pick and choose like okay well is there enough room for two gods of war? So these guys are going to stay, but there's only one room for a god of nature. So pick the best of the three, and this one, this one stays. So that, that's that's right. how I would that's how I would merge those things together. I like that. Um, I like the big battle royale, almost like a, a big wrestling match where all the gods come in, throwing people out one at a time. Well, I, I look at a pantheon as something that there is only so much power, even to the gods. So if all of a sudden you had multiple pantheons vying for for power and thus influence within the mortal world, uh-huh. you, you know, they don't want, you know, multiple, you know, people running around. Oh, well, if you don't worship me, then you're going to worship that guy. Well, if I take out that guy, then I'm going to get you as a follower just because that's what you do. And it has nothing to do with the good and the evil. It has to do with the the, the divine aspect of it. You know, right. They they all yeah. crave power. Sure, and if if uh, if especially if there's that many gods and they're not getting the power because it's all being split up from the worshiping of the people down below. Yeah, totally. So Todd Boyce says, "Do your intelligent creatures have their own pantheons, or is there just a set pantheon for the world?" There is a set pantheon for the world. The first god, Credona, is not a lot of the newer species or uh, younger generations don't necessarily even acknowledge that she is the original God and worship some of the, some of the, some of her children. So uh, the idea is there's the, the main God, Credona, her children and her sister, Girma had followed her and they got into a giant fight and she had her own child. So there's a uh, six of Credona's children, one of Girma's children and Credona and Girma is gone now. So, so total, total. Well, very cool. Seven, eight, yeah. So we are down to just over 20 minutes left. If you uh, missed out on the earlier announcement, jump down to the description below, sign up for the gleam contest. Brian is going to be doing a live announcement for a awesome giveaway prize is about $300. So get in on your last chance uh, or, you know, don't, don't come crying to me. If you didn't, if you missed it, <laughs> somebody in this stream should win. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping so because that would you know that would that would make it that much more awesome for for everybody Absolutely. so Absolutely. brian smith says any tips on creating groups herds bands of creatures so uh, it's it's everybody approaches this sort of thing completely differently and for me i start i start with the visual side of things so and then i think about the region that they're in like i sculpt one like, and then I'm like, all right, which region would this fit in because of how it looks, the physiology of it? And then from there, how they interact with all the other species that already live there. And whether both uh, as far as society, as far as where they fit on the the, the food chain and, and pecking order of things. And uh, that that's kind of, I go in, in steps like that. So there's, there's a couple different ways to approach putting something new in your world you can do uh the whole i want to make something you put it in the world not thinking about any ramifications on you know what it is and how it's going to influence the world because there's always enough stuff that that out there so throw caution to the wind dive in and have fun you can approach it as you were saying from the visual aspect and then figure out the minutia level there uh, if you're talking about from an RPG perspective, you can create the stats first so that you can then use it in your game and then figure out the minutia. Or you can look at, well, I want to create this creature that has a this function in my world and then figure out from there what it does and, and how, how, 
how you figure out everything else. Well, what does it then look like? What are its stats? You know, so you can approach it from any angle just as long as you are willing to, to do the work and have, have fun with it. Absolutely. And a lot of times you have to, depending on what's going on in your world at the time, you have to choose a different approach depending on what, what you've got going on. So Peter wants to know, it sounded like you dabble in multi multiple mediums, drawing, sculpting, and woodwork. Is there any media you wish you could explore or practice more? Yes, I'm hoping to get better at painting and digital painting over the, uh, the next year or two because I've just started, uh, I've had to do the full body illustrations of my creatures for the book, and I'd like to strengthen that form a good bit. I think I, I still have a ways to learn on that, and I could, I could definitely get better at it, so. So Josh wants to know, are there regional variants of your creatures? Ha, huh, there are, and the only one so far that is come up aside. So the Reapers were the original species that were on, on the world after the gods. And as they went out and migrated to different areas of the world, they evolved differently. But they're essentially their own species now. But so far, the only ones that I've created are a variation of the Groblin because they're almost, they're my most common humanoid in the world. It's kind of like a, uh, a nicer, less, uh, a nicer version of a goblin. That's kind of where the play on words was with the goblin. Um, and so like in the icy divide region, the coloration slightly different. This, the, the bone structure is a little bit different to adapt to the cold, um, things like that. So, and there will be more as I, my book is called Revelo Creature Collection Volume One. I do intend to do more than one volume, so I'm going to have to expand on those species as as time goes on. Uh, we have a uh, you know uh, we we mentioned her earlier, and she she apparently was summoned. Uh, Crystal Sully says, "Hey Brian, hey Ted, wishing you best of luck on the Kickstarter, man. The campaign and both the campaign and the book both look ace. Not that you Thank need you, the Crystal. luck. You got this. You got this, yo. <laughs> Thank you, Crystal. I really appreciate that. So that's that's. I can't awesome wait to get her book in the mail. Uh, yeah, I, I backed it as well. So, uh, yep. uh, so let's see here. Any other questions? Um, do you have any, some aquatic or undead types in your material? Okay, from so Fantasy, Fantasy Grounds College. Hey, Fantasy Grounds College. Let's see. I will answer both of them. So yes and yes. So for the aquatic life, I have... There's the Depths Unknown, which is the water that's surrounding the continent of Revelo. And then there's also the Salts. So I have some creatures in both of those areas. The Salts is like on the southern region of the world. Um, there's a little bit of an island there and a, a bay in that area. One of, uh, side note here, uh, if uh, you guys know Jared Blando, he's an amazing uh, cartographer. He's done a lot of work for a lot of different big companies. I've gotten my second iteration of the map that he's working on for me. And that's going to be on the inside front and back. It looks nice. Awesome. I can't wait till, uh, till I see the finished one. But uh, so, uh, and then for the undead, I have uh, what I call the unliving. Uh, they're the, uh, when the two main gods, Credona and her sister battled um, and Credona put all of my gods into hibernation. Uh, Credona's sister had a daughter, had a daughter named the veil and she, Credona trapped her inside a forest because she was essentially very, very evil and bound her magically to the forest. And that forest became the forest of the dead. And what she has done while being trapped in there is fed off of all living things that happen to come into that forest. So she is essentially creating uh, zombies, but I call them the unliving. And she has them then go out and bring more food to feed her to try and keep her alive and give her energy while she's inside this, this horrible forest. Wow, that, that sounds uh, you know pretty uh, pretty horrific. Uh, you know, based off of you know what what you were you were saying there, you know, kind of sparked a, a thought. I recently used a a kraken in one of my D and D games. Do you have any like terrible legendary monsters in Revelio? So no, the 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 uh, species there are more. Their, their uh, mythology and their stories talk more about the the one god of the water that has these, it's almost like a giant frog-like creature that has these tentacles on its back. And they talk about that being the thing that keeps anyone from actually leaving the continent. It's like, that's what's out cool. at sea. Even though it's supposed to be in hibernation, that's what's, uh, that's what's keeping boats or anything from ever leaving. 
So like um, I played Ravenloft a lot in high school. That was probably my favorite campaign setting. So I like the idea of the Revelo, the continent itself. It's almost like a Bermuda Triangle. You can come in from anywhere, but you can't really leave. Wow. Uh, that That's almost scary. Uh, Todd, Todd, Todd Boyce says, do any of your intelligence species eat any other intelligent species? That is correct. <laughs> yes, uh, that, that's yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, you'll, you'll have to read the book to find out. Uh, oh, that, that's fine. Yeah. I got no, no problems with you know, not spoiling it. Uh, you know, DEC7M2 says, did you ever do a creature doodle when you were a kid that made it into your book? I did not, and there are no. All of the the creatures in there now are are current. Um, if you look at the Kickstarter page, though, you'll see one of my son's drawings, because uh, I was at Origins this past year in Ohio, and Origins the Sunday of the convention is Father's Day, so as my Father's Day gift, he drew me a a fire turtle because that's he created the fiery pits, that volcanic region. He wants to create all the creatures from there, so he drew that, and the first thing I sculpted when I got home was that was that creature. So. That photo, that uh, his illustration isn't in the book, but it's on the Kickstarter, and I, I actually got to have that in a gallery show here in my hometown uh, in a two-person show I was in. So I had his his concept art next to my sculpture in the show. That that is really cool. Um, yeah, you know, I, I I did see that picture, and I love seeing, you know, when when you have a child's art. What they they have got such you know awesome imaginations, and I, I see it with my own kids. My my son's nine, my daughter is five, and they they come up with some of the the craziest things. But they don't always have the ability to put down what they see in their head, mm -hmm. you know, in 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 a in a specific medium. So uh, a while ago, there was a an artist that actually sat down with kids and took their drawings and totally re re redid their stuff based on what they said and what they drew. Did you, did you see that That's at all? Awesome. I've seen one, uh, like a family that does that, like the father and two kids that do that. And I think they have a Patreon that I, that I checked out that looked really amazing. Um, I'm, and I think there's, I there's also, go ahead. I don't know the specific artist, you know, off the top of my head, uh -huh. um, but it was something that, something that my wife, my, my wife showed me. And some of the things it's like, wow, like the, the jump, that was made from what they put down on the paper, but what, what they were trying to do uh -huh. and, you know, and artists that are willing to give up their time to really, truly give the, the, the vision it's just do uh -huh. is pretty awesome. Yeah. That's fantastic. The, anything you can do to encourage and enable kids to be creative is you need to do it. Like uh, my daughter just turned four yesterday and I already have the land. Thanks. I already have the land planned out for where creatures are going to come from to fit into the whole world setting for her, because she's nice. already mo uh, more of a storyteller and already like likes the idea of of adding to things. So, a couple years, she'll uh, she'll have some creatures in her name. Very cool. So, does your world feature any megalithic ruins or structures possible from earlier times from the progenitor race? Uh, it does not. No. Your your world is somewhat newer, right? From what you were saying. Yeah, I, I have the whole timeline written down. So like everything, almost everything is pretty much known about the world. So it's not like there's anything that dates back. When this god came here, she formed this world, and it's in all the current history books in Revlo as to everything that's transpired. So. So we actually, uh, you know, given uh, the whole kid thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Elf Bates says, I sculpted a miniature based on one of my daughter's sketches. Awesome. Very cool, Elf Bait. Uh, so we are we are down uh, to just about 10 minutes until Brian is going to release the winner. So if you've, if you've come in and you're still haven't heard or still haven't gotten onto that Gleam contest, down in the description below, go sign up. You're getting down to that last uh, last 10 minutes. Yes. Very exciting. So you said currently you're you're playing fate more often than than anything else. Uh, yes. right? Yeah, so I, I'm I'm running a fate game. 
I was in a 5e game, but I had to bow out of that because I need to run a secondary fate game because I need to play test all my rules for the book I'll be writing after once this uh once this book's done and and off my off my plate. So I want to try and make sure I get all that uh, toned down as much as possible. I've I've played Fate Accelerated a couple of times. I've yet uh -huh. to actually get a solid Fate Core game in. Uh -huh. uh, but you know, as as many of our fans know, I'm a huge Dresden Files fan. So I yep. got the full Dresden Files package for awesome. Christmas. I have all all four books. Now Excellent. I'm actually looking for a I'm actually looking for a DM who is familiar enough with the material and familiar enough with Fate who's going to run it for me. Because I don't, I don't learn systems by reading books. I learn no. by playing. Uh, I totally get I that. Go ahead. Yeah, so, like, that—that's one of the, one of those things that I'm like, all right, I know the material. Uh, as I've I've listened to, you know, I've read the books, I've listened to them many times. Uh, it's just it's something that there's something that that speaks to me about this story that I just love going back to over and over again, and. Like now, I, I I ran the game in a different setting years ago, just after the Fate book was released. Mm -hmm. But it was like, all right, well, I don't know Fate; I know something else. So I ran it in Mutants and Masterminds uh -huh. because I knew I knew that system. Sure, and totally. I knew I knew enough about the material. But that was you know years before we started doing Nerdarchy, and you know now now I'm on that hunt for the GM. Gotcha. Well, I, I don't know that well enough to run it, but um, I could introduce you to the Fate Core system, and then you could adapt that to the Dresden Bile stuff, because um, the more I play Fate, the more I love it. It's uh, it's okay. simple, yet cinematic, and it's very story-driven, and everything should be over-the-top amazing in, in my eyes. It's like you, the game just keeps the pace of it seems to go really well. It doesn't seem to get slowed down and bogged down. Uh, that's one of the biggest things. It's like when the last game I ran, everybody in my group showed up. There were eight of us at the table. And it's still like the pacing was good and everything moved fine. And if, if we were running 5e, everything would have taken twice as long. <laughs> I, I have I have heard that you know five E is is definitely better than some of the other editions that I've seen. Mm -hmm. um, you know when it comes to to the pacing and and I love it. I'm never gonna I'm never gonna get fully away from D and D. Uh, it's it's been you know just just too much in my history. But I am I am always trying to reach out and try other systems, not only so that I'm a better gamer, but mm -hmm. so that I can figure out like, oh, well, is there something that this system is doing better that I can incorporate into my my GMing style and you know and or you know the actual game that I that I'm playing. So we have a uh, a question from Brian Smith. It says, "Have you made any creature that would work with an asteroid impact in Michigan? We just had a comet burn up above Detroit, and it's freaking everybody out." No, that's crazy. I have not, and that would freak me out as well. Uh, I I haven't left like the ground level much. I haven't looked up into the stars for any of my species at this point, but uh, there's still plenty of time as the world continues to to grow and evolve. I had another question here, and I can't seem to find it. All right, oh, chats. The cat, chat keeps jumping on me, so we'll just we'll just gotcha. continue uh, continue moving on. Uh, cool. Besides fate, besides fate and D and D, uh, are there any other systems that you enjoy playing in, or that that you you have played? So let's see. I mean, growing up, I played all sorts of systems. I, I played. Uh, D and D first, second edition. Then I played uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles ga uh, game. Um, Palladium. I pl yeah, I played. I played a lot of different Palladium games. I played Rifts. Um, I played Cthulhu a handful of times. Um, but I always tended. I always went back to D and D because I could. I'd run and like the D twenty system. Like I ran a Sin City game in D twenty. Um, uh, so all all that back uh, back before it went to four E. I never played fourth edition at all. Um, I kind of dropped off the the gaming surface for a little while, and then when five E okay. came out, we started getting back into that. So, uh, so let's see here. It says, oh, I think I think we actually know the answer to this one. Uh, Fantasy Grounds College, would you be interested in promoting your product and selling? 
uh, our community to use fake core? Yes, of course. We will talk after the show. Uh, geography wise, is Revelio one island, a chain of them, a continent, planet, or something else? So, right now, it's it's I call it World of Revelo, but it's a continent, as far as anybody knows. Um, there is more to it, though, because there have been outlanders that have been coming in from a different continent that uh, that isn't really spoken about at this point. And then there will also be the place that will be for my daughter Ruby. Uh, once she's a little bit older, because uh, up until a day before she was born, her middle name was going to be Savage. So there, I can't use Savage Lands. I can't use Savage World, Savage Kingdom. It's, there's going to be Savage in the name somehow. I just got to figure out what's going to work and sound right that's not going to be biting on somebody else's thing. But So there's going to be that section as well. But this this big continent takes up a huge portion of the whole, the whole uh, circumference or... Is that right for the surface area? Yeah, anyway, of the world. Uh, that's that's the one thing about world building is you you don't always know when you start out on a project how big everything is. And if you put limitations on yourself and then you realize I want to do more beyond, you kind of get stuck. So right. the the campaign world that you know Nerdarchy is doing, and we're not doing a book at the moment, we're we're just kind of building out what we need as we play. Like we've only played in like a small portion of like the lower lower hemisphere with with our world, knowing full well that our planet is is huge. It's it's you know we've we've decided that we wanted to do something that was different. So as opposed to a planet revolving around the sun, we've actually got the planet is the stationary. It's actually got you know in both hemispheres. There's they've got their own sun. It's got a reverse equator, so you've got the Arctic belt. That, uh -huh. that goes around it and we've only played in that one small portion in the lower hemisphere so you want to go to the cold area you still go north right but you're 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 getting to the wider area and there's the whole second half of our world that we just haven't haven't touched because we haven't felt the need to put anything there yet so we wanted right. to create a world that's so big that we can fit everything that's in our imaginations that we want to put in there I, th I think that's a great way to approach it because if you try to create everything in the world all at once, you'll never get to play in it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's just there's just too much to do, and plus it it limits it limits you. You want to be able to not only grow as you change and your story develops, but also the people that are playing in it have that kind of influence how things evolve in the world as well. So we got a couple of questions uh, for your world. What are unicorns like? And followed up by, what about dragons? So there are, so far there's no unicorns at this point. Um, and I have been pressured into putting my first dragon-esque creature in. So I, I've avoided dragons for the most part in the world because a lot of times people have a hard time seeing a creature and not just assuming that it's a dragon because it's a fantasy beast. Um, especially people that don't look through monster manuals on a regular basis and know there's tons of different creatures out there. But just your average like con goer would be like, ooh, look at the dragons. And you look at them and you're like, none of them are reptilian, none of them are, you know. So I've, 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 I've avoided that for a while, but my son, he loves dragons. So in the fiery pits, there's a sneak wa, which is essentially, it's like a serpent, body with wings and a dragon-like head, but doesn't have the four legs that a normal dragon or the two legs that a wyvern would have. So um, that's my first um, introduction to a dragon into my setting. I have sculpted dragons, but not in my world. All right, what about what about a uni dragon? <sighs> Interesting. We will we'll have to see about that. There's that, uh, there's that pledge level where you can collaborate on a creature in my Kickstarter, and that could be yes. put into the world if you really wanted it. So if you want to jump down to the, the Kickstarter link in the description, there is a pledge level that you can get in there and you can work with Brian and design the creature that you want. And not only will it go in the book, will it have its own story in his world, but you would then have the ability to get the sculpture mailed to you. Oh gosh, we've got three seconds left until the gleam is All over right. one second. And boom, it has ended. Let's see. All I've never right. I've never done one of these gleams, so let me see uh, if I, maybe if I just click the winners tab, it will automatically pick the winner. 
one prize you left. Should be to able draw. to hit a button. Yep, I'm gonna say draw winners, or it's gonna be one winner. Winners draw one. Limit entries by date, anytime. Okay, one winner draw. Ben Gable. Is there a Ben Gable? He entered on December twenty eighth. Okay, so that is, All right, that is well, uh, not a name I'm familiar with, but that doesn't mean he's not here in the chat. So if there's a Ben Gable out there, you know, you please can step right up. <laughs> uh, now you you uh, as part of the Gleam, you've got the ability to contact uh, Ben, so yep. you're going to be able to to reach out there and you know contact him and get all the information to send those awesome prizes his way. Well, thank you, everybody that's in the chat that may have entered. Uh, I do appreciate it, and I hope uh, I hope you'll take a look at the Kickstarter as well. Uh, I know, uh, I know, I've got it on on, uh, on my radar. We will be you know sharing it out throughout the uh, the month with all the the Kickstarter stuff that that we do. Uh, thank you. Yeah, you know, I I love I love art books. As I said, to be able to hand them out, I, I hope it will do well enough to be able to get to. The actual stat-wise level. Oh, uh, me too. Those, those, those are always uh, always fun. But I mean, if you if you know you know Crystal and you know Sarah, you know perhaps we can reach out to her, to their fan bases, and you know all latch on and have uh, have this thing do a phenomenal job as well. That would be that would be totally rad. Yeah, I actually I met Sarah at. Spectrum, I think last year, Spectrum Fantasy Art Live, she had come by and, and give me her, her business card and so, some information. That was great. So it was cool seeing seeing her uh, book do so well. And I heard that she's uh, she was just on recently for a second go. And I think she was talking about doing a second one once that one's out. Cool. Well, I've yet to yet to actually pick up the uh, the baby bestiary that they had put out, you know, or the baby mm -hmm. bestiaries. But my my nephew has it. So I've I've managed to to flip through the, flip through that one, uh, but I did pick up the or I did back the you know Crystal's book and you know uh -huh. the, the book that Sarah's doing with the Atlas Animalia, so I'm looking forward to to getting those. Um, so uh, we got we got 13 more minutes to chat. What do you want to talk about? Oh, thank you, Alan, and thank you, uh, Crystal. I do appreciate it. Um, uh, well, let's see. So I've talked a little bit about uh the world and that it being that my son helps me collaborate with it, with developing the fiery pits and some of the creatures. Um, if you haven't looked at the the Kickstarter, the world Revelo, the word itself is Oliver backwards and that's his middle name. So it was named for him. Uh, let's see some of the other things for upcoming cons. If anybody's going to them, I'm going to be doing Gen Con origins, dragon con for origins and Gen Con. It's I'm going to do, be running games for the first time. I've never run a game at a convention. I've never actually played a game at a convention either. So I'm a little uh, I'm a little nervous because I've always just run games for for my friends. But I'm going to be running the Fiery Pits game and the Icy Divide game that uh, Norse Foundry and I are going to be putting out uh, in May and June. So I'll be doing that. I'll probably also have some exclusive or um, some giveaway coins or something that I, I'm going to give to folks that, that happen to come and play in my games just to, you know, entice folks and a bit what, more. Uh, what what convention are you doing that at? Uh, Origins and Gen Con. I've submitted for both. both. Yep. Oh, cool. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be after the normal show floor closes because I'll be working my boat, my booth both days or all the days. So it'll be probably like eight to eleven thirty at night, both both shows, and early on in the convention days, probably like the or some of the earlier days, like Thursday and Saturday at Gen Con, and can't remember the days for for Origins. I'll have to look into that because I know, uh, you know, that would be that'd be pretty awesome. Uh, unicorn hoodlum wants to know, wants to know would you think of adding unicorn hoodlums to your world um well that that is if you want to go for that big old pledge level on on kickstarter that thirteen hundred dollar pledge level i would say yes we would totally talk about that is there a, is there a limit to the number of of that pledge level yes there's there's three because realistically i wanted to make sure i had enough time to do the sculptures take photos write the story and still get the production done on the timeline that i have planned out uh, 
question. Perhaps it makes some makes sense to you. What is the biome is the best? What is the biome is the best? I do not know that. Oh, he, he apparently butchered his sentence. So please, because he even wrote it. So if you want to, <laughs> if you want to rewrite that question, we'll put it in there. Right on. Um, are there regular fantasy races in the world, such as elves, dwarves, humans, etc.? And do they mount intelligent creatures hunting trophy heads on their walls like yours? I see. So there are, there currently are not other normal uh, races or species that are in like D and D. Um, there's a reason for that, and um, it's because I'm talking with uh, somebody about developing Revelo into into. A bigger something, something even bigger. So I wanted to steer away from from that for now. Um, but if you were to play it in your own game, you could definitely interject humans and elves and, and dwarves, and that would be totally cool. Um, there, there are not there. There's only one character that that hangs these mounted walls or these mounted beasts on their walls. This isn't something that happens normally in Revelo. It's just one really evil character that is yet to be introduced. That's probably going to be introduced into the storyline. And I kind of look at, I kind of look at it as seasons or uh, like seasons of a TV and show. Name or is Brian. <laughs> um, so like the, the fate core book that I'm going to like the world setting book is going to be Revelo age of discovery. So it's either going to be chapter two or chapter three of that in the storyline where I introduce that kind of um, the, the, the hunter character. That is uh that is cool. I look forward to you know being able to hear more about that character. Uh, like I said, I'm I'm eager to get a copy of the book. And you know, as Nerdarchy as Nerdarchy has you know said time and time again, you know, you just steal from everywhere. I, I constantly am taking inspiration from TV shows, books, movies, you know, mm -hmm. things that happen in my own life to influence the game world that we create and that I, and the game that I play uh, just because I think it's, it's, it's interesting to see where my mind goes. We, we uh -huh. recorded a video recently and I think, I think it's up. I'm not, I'm not certain where we, I, I had this idea and apparently it was something that I, that I saw in a, in a dream, but I wasn't certain whether I had seen something on TV and it was like flower petals, you know, floating on the wind. And somehow this twisted into the idea of like dream and memory sucking creatures that exist <laughs> in the Feywild. And it just, it, it, my, my wife was like, all right, you're, you're freaking me out here. How do you go from <laughs> here to there? And it was just, you know, you know, Dave, Nate and I having a conversation uh -huh. of, we want to have this thing. And I'm like, well, you had you had the base idea of the start of just fey bandits and i'm like well i want to use these creatures and it it twisted and turned into this whole awesome conversation and i'm i'm really excited about the the video that we were recorded like i said i don't That's even awesome. know what i don't know if it's if it's up or whether it's going up soon they you know I, once i record it or once we record it uh dave then takes over and they they go up to his schedule when you know when he does it. So, <laughs> yeah, some things just can't be controlled. But yes, you've got to pull inspiration from everywhere. One of the creatures in the book are salzerites, which are essentially like uh, in when I first moved to Georgia and I was under a house, I discovered these cave crickets that jump like grasshoppers, and they scared the crap out of me. So I turned those into a a monster in my game back in like 1999 here. And then uh, they are now in the in the book more gruesome and, and vile than than they ever were in my first game. But they terrified the crap out of my friends that n had a familiarity with that type of insect. And then having that be in the game um, was was very fun. So Michael there's something Frost that we forgot. Oh. What, what did we forget? We forgot roll no, no. call. Ah, we haven't been doing been doing roll call. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's uh, it's one one of those things that like we we've been getting more and more people in the chat, and it just takes uh -huh. up so much time, and the fact that my my chat keeps jumping, uh -huh. I just don't think it's gonna gonna go over well. So right on, uh, I totally get that. Uh, but uh, as we, as we're saying, uh, we have a have a question. Michael Frost wants to know what is. 
uh, your favorite monster or beast from D and D. Favorite one from D and D. Hmm. That's so hard because there are so many that are just amazing. Um, creature creature wise. I don't know what it is about it. I am a huge fan of the displacer beast. Uh huh. Of course. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's from, just from, amazing from a, you know, the encounter design aspect, they are a challenge at multiple levels. You then have the ability to elevate them, you know, in, in some way, shape, or form, turn them into a legendary creature. You have the ability to put a powerful creature on them that, you know, mm -hmm. that's their mount. So now both the creature and it is displaced. Uh, I am, I'm a huge cat lover you know, uh -huh. from... You know, from, from you know, I have I have house cats. I always always have been a cat person, and you know, to me, the 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 feline hunter is an awesome thing. Mm -hmm. you know, then you then twist it by having it have you know six legs and tentacles and crazy, crazy, crazy. Yep, uh, I dig those. I always tend to go back to something as simplistic as a gelatinous cube, just because that are some that's some of my earliest uh, memories uh, of D and D. And like even introducing the gelatinous cube to my son and even the like the plastic D and D like one that you can open up and put other things inside of. That's just, it, it's so silly that uh, I, I tend to go back to that, even though it's not the most magnificent of beasts by far. Um, it's got a special place in my heart. So Michael Frost says displacer beast is mine. Uh, mine as well. I made a variant of it. Crystal Sully says, Ted, I'm right there with you. Ha <laughs> ha. Phase cast for the win. Yes. You've totally won this round. Uh, I, gelatinous cubes to me, there's just, they're, they're far more straightforward. They can be terrifying. If you use them, if you use them right. I love the idea of, you know, putting a gelatinous cube that has had enough things to eat that it literally takes up the entire hallway. So there's no way uh -huh. to get by it, above it, below it, and it's coming forward. You then have something else behind. So it's like, well, do we try to like you you make it be a long enough hallway and there's a threat on both sides? Do they go deal with the threat behind or do they attempt to fight their way through the gelatinous cube? So like mm -hmm. you can you can do a lot of fun with it. But I, I just think that there's intelligent design from somebody else. Right. Whereas with the uh, with the displacer beasts, I think there's more room to 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 use them as that hunter. You, know, you can have them terrifying a, a very low level party because they don't know where it really is and what have you. And then, as I said, you know you can use them in an elevated status or a mount for a much later game. I, I totally get that. So Walt says, my warlock wants to find a baby gelatinous cube for a pet. <laughs> it's not going to be a very affectionate pet. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's all about the snuggly. It just you. burns. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so any, any last minute... Uh, Thoughts, feelings, questions, ideas that you want to, to put out there as we're, you know, getting down to the last couple minutes? No, I'm just, uh, I hope everybody takes a look and uh, at the Kickstarter just so you can see what I'm, what I've been creating. And if you're out and about at conventions this year, hopefully you can stop by and say hi to me at, at the booth. I try and chat up everybody that comes by and I always just love talking about weird dorky stuff with folks. So, you know. Especially if people can come up and see my creatures in person, and and uh, I don't mind people touching them and stuff like that, just so you can get a better idea of the textures of of pieces. And if anybody's interested in sculpting or uh, uh, learning stuff like that, I'm also I've got a few videos from last year on my YouTube channel showing the process of, of doing stuff. And I'm always open to sharing process with folks because the more people that are making stuff, the better. Awesome. Uh, so absolutely, jump down the description below. Go check out that Kickstarter. 
it's it's going to be awesome and if you're really into into world building this is going to be a world that you know you really want to take a look at and and share and as i've as as i've said as nerdarchy said over and over again this is going to be a nice big resource that you can steal from to make your world that much cooler you'll be able to take take his creatures use them as is right out of the book or you know twist them and turn them on their heads so that you can make your own things uh, I know I'm gonna, you know, be doing a combination thereof because awesome. that's what I do as a GM. You know, I take things whole cloth that I like, and I take things that I like portions of, and say, "All right, let me stick these other pieces on here and shove." I've got this, and I'm ready to go. <laughs> I can't wait to see what people come up with. And please, if you take stuff and you use it in your game and twist things around, share them with me because I love seeing what folk, what other folks do. All right, so. Uh, Brian, thanks for hanging out with us. Everybody in the thanks chat, for having me. Can go check, go check out that Kickstarter. And until next time, stay nerdy. Stay nerdy, folks.